With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hey, sweetie, what do you think of our new car from Carvana? Think it can handle our busy family? Well, we have seven days to see. First, we can take the scenic route to the beach and stargaze through the moon roof. We'll see if your drums fit in the trunk. Then we can pick up mommy's friends and check out that leg room. And we should really visit grandma. She's getting up there. That's like a whole lifetime in seven days. And like one busy family. With our seven-day money-back guarantee, you can confidently shop for cars 100% online. Visit Carvana.com for all terms and conditions. We'll drive you happy at Carvana. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour One. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here nationwide. The phone number, if you want to be on the program, 877-973-7425. You can always follow me online at EW Erickson across most social media platforms. Well, there actually is only one big story today happening right now. Uh, and it actually is, it doesn't matter if you were in France or even Russia or in a Thailand or in Australia or in Brazil, it doesn't matter. It is the same story on the front page of every major news outlet around the world. Uh, the entire British royal family has been summoned to Balmoral. Uh, to attend to Her Majesty the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II. Now, I, list, I I realize as Americans out of the gate, we're like, how does this story affect us? It doesn't. One of the, the weird little quirks of life in, in doing a show like this is, is I try to focus not on like the red meat for conservatives today, but actually what is the big news story of the day? And oftentimes I have to convince people it actually is the big news story today. This no one has to be convinced is the biggest news story of the day. Literally, you go to any uh, news site on planet Earth right now uh, that's a mainstream media outlet and it's the number one, number two or number three story. Uh, in most, it's the number one or number two story. But for a conservative audience in the United States, say, why do we even care? Well, there are some reasons you actually should care about the story, even if you're not a monarchist, even if you're not an Anglophile, even if you you couldn't care less. Uh, the, one of the reasons is that she has been the queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland for one third of the history of the United States. Yeah, let me say that again. She has been queen for one-third of our nation's history. Think about that. Um, really 30% as opposed to 33%, but 30% of our history as a, as a nation under our Constitution, uh, she's been the queen, which is remarkable. 88% of the United Kingdom is under the age of 70, and no one under the age of 70 has ever known another queen of England. She has met every president of the United States since Harry Truman, except Lyndon Johnson, with whom she communicated, although he never went to England. Put this in further perspective, and this is actually why I'm most fascinated by this. The Queen of England, Elizabeth II, Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, da 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 da, -da the Queen of England. Her first prime minister was Winston Churchill, who was born shortly after the American Civil War. Her present prime minister, Liz Truss, was born in 1975. This is why I actually think this is a really important story. In addition to a milestone moment around the planet, I mean, literally, if you're under the age of 70, there's never been another monarch in England. Um, and she really, inarguably, I would say, this may be impolite for some, is the last uh, practicing Christian crown of England, which is, is another milestone as England transitions beyond Christianity. But really, one of the biggest important issues here is the span of human history. 
within the lifetimes of people. Just consider this. The grandfathers of the American Revolution, the grandfathers of the people who fought in the American Revolution fought in the English Civil War. The grandfathers of the American Revolution or the American Civil War, Confederates and Yankees, fought in the American Revolution. The grandfathers of the men who fought in World War I fought the American Civil War. And it was the fathers of the men who fought in World War II who fought World War I, or in some cases, they themselves were refighting. The spans of American history are actually pretty phenomenal. So my grandfather, my dad's dad, I am one of many in a long line of Eric's. My grandfather once told me that I was the 16th, that he did not want my dad to be named Eric, and yet it was, and then my parents named me Eric, and I was the 16th. Of course, my grandfather also told me he was a reindeer herder, and that wasn't so. But nonetheless, uh, I've maintained it as so, and my cousins in Sweden, when I've gone to visit and I asked the question, believe it to be so. Nonetheless, uh, whether I am or I am not, uh, it, it makes for a great thing to tell people at the dinner party. Well, my family told me, but nonetheless, we don't actually know uh, my grandfather's lifespan, although we, we presume he died in his 90s, if not 100. He came to the United States as a kid, jumped ship in Philadelphia, and lived, was born before World War I, lived, moved to the United States, installed the first elevator in Atlanta, Georgia, a Swede, made his way from Philadelphia down to Miami. He hated the cold, installed the first elevator in Atlanta, Georgia. He and my grandmother owned a boarding house on Peachtree Street. My dad's oldest sister, my Aunt Leela, her first job during the Depression was to work the weekends at WSB Radio in Atlanta. And now here I am, my flagship station, WSB. But that, that intersection with my grandfather puts like I knew him when I was a child and he knew people who inarguably had been born in the early 1800s given his lifespan. So my great, my grandfather knew people who were born as the American nation was really coming into be. And, and many of us are like that. The, the span of human history encapsulated within three generations goes a very long time. And so now here we are winding down towards the end. An announcement could come about uh, Queen Elizabeth. It has not yet. I will tell you this by protocol. What will happen is before the public is told, the Prime Minister of Great Britain will be called, and she's new to the job. She's two days into the job. She will be called and told that London Bridge has fallen. That's the code for Her Majesty the Queen is dead. She will just be told that London Bridge has fallen. Once she is told that London Bridge has fallen, her obligation then as the Chief Prime Minister is to call all the other Prime Ministers of the 16 other nations for which the Queen is the Queen and tell them the Queen is dead and then call the 33 other nations that who used to be under the queen who are still part of the commonwealth and tell them the queen is dead and then an alarm will sound at the bbc now this is important there's an alarm at the bbc for these national events the bbc is the british broadcasting corporation when i was a kid living in dubai i had a shortwave radio and you could get this is the bbc and an alarm will sound. The last time the alarm sound was when Prince Philip, her husband, died. When it went off, no one knew what the alarm was. They thought it was a fire alarm. It hadn't rung in so long. But it is the alarm for when major national news happens. It will go off. They will be very familiar with it now since it only happened a year or so ago with Philip. And they're already in black, which tells you the thinking is probably that she's already dead. But maybe she's not. Keep her in your prayers, please. And her son. They will not skip over Charles. I know Americans have this feeling, well, they should give it to Char they should give it to William and skip over Charles. They won't do that because he will be the king of England. In fact, the whole reason they summon the entire family to where the current crown is dying is so at the moment it happens, everybody's got to kiss the ring of the new guy and pledge their loyalty to him. 
they can't leave the house without doing it. So he's got all of his brothers and his sister there, all of his kids there, including Harry. The wives of his sons are not there. Uh, Catherine and, and Megan are not there. The sons will pledge their loyalty to him. The brothers will pledge their loyalty to him. The sisters, the brothers-in-law and the sister-in-laws will pledge loyalty to him. The whole house will, and he'll be the king. Now, the question is, does he go with King Charles III or does he go with something else? Given the history of the Charleses on the crown of England, he probably shouldn't. Who knows? His wife will be the queen, whether people like it or not. All of this is something that the world has not seen in 70 years. All of this is something the British people, there's no way to know how they will react to it. If the the emotional outpouring over the death of Princess Diana is a hint of things to come, you've got to remember that these people view her as the mother of their nation. Many of these people, because she's been on the throne for so long, have known her. Word will come when it comes, not a moment before that, which sounds silly to say, except whether the event happens or not, we don't know until they've made it official. It is the big story on planet Earth today. Now, there are plenty of other news stories. I'm not going to dwell past this. Don't really need phone calls from you on this. No offense. It actually is the big story of the day, though. It's a bigger story in Great Britain, obviously, than here. I have to tell you, I have a friend of mine who is is uh, about two decades younger than the queen. She was not yet crowned when he was born, but close. He doesn't actually have a memory of anyone other than her being queen. And he commented to me one time, a couple years ago, he's an American now, but grew up over there, commented to me that uh, it would be as devastating as losing your own grandmother when she died. So for those of you who have lost your grandparents, keep that perspective in mind. They literally have known no other queen. The thing that you've got to really understand here more than anything else is when our founders founded our nation, our president was to be the embodiment of the nation and not just a political figure. It's become harder over time now. Look at the reaction to Barack Obama's portrait unveiling at the White House. Republicans hated it. Democrats loved it. I actually objectively so don't think it was a bad picture. Uh, I've got comments on it for later I'll, I'll make, but it wasn't a terrible picture. But you now view the president of the United States based on your partisan loyalty. There was a time in this country where Democrats could say, yes, the president, though he's not ours, it's our president. And there was a time Republicans could say the Democratic president, yes, he's our president, though I don't like him. Now it's very hard. Uh, your view of the country is based on who the president is. Is is it the president of your party? You're probably okay with the country. Is it the president of the other party? You probably hate the country. It's a sad, damning indictment on how partisan America has become that we now look to our country this way. The Brits have a queen who is the embodiment of the nation, soon to be a king who is the embodiment of the nation. And so the politicians are the politicians. And the national identity sits under a crown. And so you can still love the country based on who sits on the throne, who is not a partisan figure, who does not weigh in on the politics of the day in public. And so you have some tie to your country that transcends politics. It is that person whose image is on the currency, that person whose image is the one known, that one is the image that shows up for all of the events of civic unity. Nowadays, a president shows up for an event of civic unity, whether it's Memorial Day or the 4th of July. And it becomes a partisan affair. Maybe one day we'll go back to it where we're not as partisan, but I doubt it. But in the UK, that still happens. The national identity is wrapped around the embodiment of the person who sits on the throne. And so as that person shifts, it becomes a cataclysmic event in the psyche of those people. So not so much here. There are plenty of people here who are fascinated with the British monarchy. It's something we don't have. It's something that they kind of are our cousins. We are of an Anglo system. In fact, it is unique in world history that those surviving successor countries to the British Empire tend to be the most stable because the British went out of their way to bring in their democratic system of governance to those countries. The former French and Spanish colonies tend to descend into third world kleptocracy. The British ones tend to be fairly stable uh, regardless of where they are on planet Earth. It's, it's one of the unique aspects of the fall of the British Empire that did give some level of stability around the world. So there is a fascination here. And arguably, though, it doesn't matter where you go in the world today. 
whether you're in looking at a newspaper or a news channel in Tokyo, Japan right now, as I am, believe it or not, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Kenya, or in France, or even here in the United States. One of the top stories is the royal family has been summoned to Her Majesty the Queen's bedside in Balmoral, Scotland. The end appears to be near, and the news may come very soon. So keep that family in your prayers. And now we have to move on to American news because there's a ton of it here. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Before I actually get into the polling research I want to talk about on mythologies and and left-wing disinformation, you, you need to actually stick around for this. Buddy of mine, he's probably the pollster I respect the most in the country, has done some deep research uh, and I'm going to get into that, and and you can always get the replay of it if you miss it by subscribing to the email. Text DATA to 33777 and subscribe. We'll be pushing it out later. Before I get into any of that, though, there is a, a death I need to report on. Bernard Shaw has died. Uh, he was one of the uh, anchors at CNN. When I was a kid, uh, Bernie Shaw was iconic. I met him one time in passing. He had left CNN by the time I was there, uh, but I got to meet him once. Absolutely an iconic person. Um, he, when the Gulf War started, you know, when I was a kid, seeing him on television, reporting just absolutely incredibly uh, captivating, compelling television. Of course, Fox came along and really began to dominate the news, but he was kind of the the standard bearer for the integrity of journalism for a while, surely of the left. Um, But regardless, he did such a good job as a journalist, and you're you're seeing those old guards pass. As we see this rise in new journalists cropping up around the planet, oftentimes uh, they're of the left, like so many journalists are, but they take a, a very specific view that they should be partisans of the left. Wes Lowry is a reporter for CBS News. He had been with the New York Times. He's one of those people that the media thinks is a voice you have to listen to. Uh, He's one of the privileged elite. The media insists he's a necessary voice because he sees racism everywhere. Anything he doesn't like is racism. He will tell you how it is racist. And if you disagree with him, you are a racist. But yet the media considers him an objective reporter. He's an aggressive partisan. He wrote the fawning hagiography of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in GQ magazine the other day that's gotten so much buzz. Let me read you a tweet of his. He's since deleted it. The death of a person seen as near deity by the white political ruling and media class, but who was also at one point the oppressive ruler of something like 30% of the global population, is going to provide an excellent example of the subjectivity of straight news reporters. The death of a person seen as near deity by the white political ruling and media class, but who was also at one point the oppressive ruler of something like 30% of the global population, is going to provide an excellent example of the subjectivity of straight news reporting. This is a guy who is cast in the role of straight news reporter by CBS News and is not. These younger reporters who come up no longer value the idea of telling it straight. We know their biases. I know my biases. But I try very hard to understand the arguments of the other side so that I can at least explain to you what's going on in the world and give you my perspective, but also try to charitably give you the other side's perspective honestly so I can explain to you honestly why I do disagree with it. This is one of the rising voices of the media who has no even inclination to care about what the other side thinks or how the other side views the world and therefore cannot accurately convey to you how the world actually works because he can't get past his own perceived biases. It's something Bernard Shaw, who is dead today, actually did a very good job at. Republican and Democratic administrations and politicians alike respected him because though they knew he probably was of the left, 
He gave them a fair hearing for their ideas, and he challenged them not as someone of the left, but as someone who was skeptical of everyone. That's a lost art in the media, and it's why nobody trusts the media anymore, and people like Wes Lowry should probably understand that, as should his employers. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show across the nation. The phone number is 877-973-7425. I, I won't repeat the whole thing. I don't want to bore you. But I have to say it was a very good monologue I did one time on mythologies. How, you know, the the... The Greeks in particular, the Egyptians and others, the, the formations of nation, nascent religions and uh, mythologies of old, they came up with ideas on how the world worked. There are some who would argue that Christianity itself is a mythology. I would disagree, but I, 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 I see their point to a degree on how, I mean, the Greeks had this entire pantheon of gods, and they explained everything. Why did lightning strike Zeus through a, a thunderbolt? Why is the, the Narcissus flower by the side of the spring? Well, because Narcissus was a very vain man who stared at himself so long he grew roots and the gods turned him into the flower. They, why did the sun cross the sky? Apollo on a chariot as Helios drove across the sky every day. His sister, twin sister Artemis at night would do the same with the moon. None of it made sense when you uh, stop to think about it. It's one thing as an aside, uh, not to go off on theological side point here, but um, for 2,000 years now, Christianity has been surprisingly consistent. There actually are very few things that anyone can point out that that are deeply contradictory within Christianity, and those where there are some contradictions, there are rational, thoughtful explanations for why, including, for example, supposed contradictions in the uh, New Testament of the gospel accounts. Why is one thing somewhere? Why is uh, Jesus supposedly has an encounter and then a second encounter later, but in the other book at their first, there are reasons for who's being told the story, how the story is being told, who the audience is that explain virtually every single one of those things. And even when you disagree with those things, even someone like Bart Ehrman, who has fallen out of Christianity and is a critic of the faith, will say uh, that there are, none of these things really, at the end of the day, contradict the basic tenets of Christianity from the virgin birth to the physical resurrection of Christ. And there is a comprehensive worldview that comes from it. In fact, I would say, and I realize I'm biased in this, that Christianity is the only uh, worldview that explains the world currently as it is and shows you where the world is headed. We are seen with environmentalists, we're seen with the left, we're seen uh, them trying to form a worldview, the environmentalists in particular. In fact, I really would encourage you, in all honesty, this isn't to get your money or anything, I just, I wish you would read it today. Uh, if you will text data to 33777, I, I put in more precise form what I've been telling you on the radio about the return of the Dark Ages. On September 4th, 476 AD, Romulus Augustus stepped down from the throne of the Western Roman Empire. That is the moment historians say the world entered the Dark Ages. What came in the Dark Ages? Population in the West declined, global temperatures rose, and people began migrating around the world in greater numbers. Historians believe the Roman Empire's descent uh, in 476 AD began the Dark Ages, and it did not end until 1000 AD. Now, 1,022 years after the end of the Dark Ages, population is declining again, temperatures are rising again, and people are moving restlessly about the planet, and we're entering into this new Dark Ages. And in those Dark Ages of old, superstitions began to take effect. And we see that with environmentalists now, but not just with environmentalists. We see it with the left as well. There are superstitions and mythologies to explain the world. And right now, much of the media is obsessively focused on disinformation and misinformation on the right. And everything you believe on the right is misinformation or disinformation. One of the pollsters I respect the most 
in the United States is a guy, he's a dear friend of mine. His name is Chris Wilson. He's worked for a lot of Republican candidates around the country that you know. He and I have been talking about the polling, and he and I tend to agree that it was not really a dour mood in the country for the GOP right now, but the Dobbs decision, yet, in fact, it did have an impact. The Republicans' inability to articulate a response that calmed people down had a direct impact on what's going on. Uh, but the polling still remains particularly biased in favor of the Democrats. Um, in fact, he told me in a text earlier today that uh, the average error of media polling had the Democrats, on average, up 12.8% from where they actually wound up on Election Day. And we should keep that in mind. We may be missing the red wave now. It was smaller than it was, but still big, and we now can't see it because of the polling errors. I, I kind of think that the Republicans were boasting they could pick up a D plus 10, D plus 12 seat. Now they can't, but they can still pick up a D plus 3, a D plus 4 seat, which means they could pick up Georgia. They could pick up Nevada. Uh, they could pick up Arizona. Uh, I don't know if they will with Arizona. Blake Masters is a uniquely bad candidate, it seems. But nonetheless, they could. But the Democrats tell themselves their world is right. Their worldview is right. They have an accurate grasp on things. And the things you and I believe are misinformation and disinformation. So Chris Wilson and WPA, uh, his polling firm, you can follow them, WPA Intel, or if you subscribe to the Daily Show Notes, you'll find the link today. Text DATA to 33777. Let me read you this. With much of the media's coverage of misinformation focusing on right-leaning sources, we wanted to examine the prevalence of conspiracy theories and falsehoods on the left. We presented a nationally representative sample of voters with a series of statements and asked them to rate them as mostly true, somewhat true, somewhat false, or mostly false. Here are the results. Our national poll of registered voters found that 52% of Democrats, including nearly half of MSNBC viewers, believe the Supreme Court recently outlawed abortion in the United States. This is false. 52% of Democrats... 45% of self-described liberals, 51% of white Democratic women, 46% of MSNBC viewers, 54% of college-educated Democratic women believe the Supreme Court outlawed abortion in the United States. 54% of college-educated Democratic women, more than Democrats in general, those college-educated women are dumb. It's not true. The Supreme Court did not outlaw abortion in the United States. The end of Roe v. Wade did not ban abortion. What it did is it returned it to the states. And yet, more than half of Democrats believe something that is not true. In our poll, we also asked the respondents whether they believe the 2016 election was stolen by Vladimir Putin and the Russians. 45% of Democrats believe it was stolen. 47% of MSNBC viewers believe it was stolen. 42% of self-described liberals believe it was stolen. To their credit, uh, Democratic women are less likely to believe it than overall, which is good because it wasn't stolen by Vladimir Putin. After months of left-wing activists in the media branding Florida's parental rights and education law as the don't say gay law, we found 67% of MSNBC viewers and 74% of college-educated Democratic women actually believe Florida banned the word gay in schools. It hasn't done that at all. It's not even in the legislation. But yet, because of media coverage, mainstream media coverage, you should understand, not just MSNBC, but mainstream media coverage, 67% of Democrats believe that. 62% of CNN viewers believe Florida banned the word gay in all schools. Interestingly enough, 74% of, of Democratic college-educated women believe this. Where are they getting their news? Following a viral Stephen King tweet and a debunked Salon article 
claiming Florida requires professors and students to register their political views. Our poll found 35% of Democrats believe it's true that Florida now requires students and professors to register their political views, but 41% of MSNBC viewers believe it and 44% of college-educated white Democratic women believe this. 44% of white college-educated Democratic women believe a viral tweet from Stephen King that was not true. Our poll found that 60% of white Democrats, 63% of self-described liberals, and over half of CNN's viewership who are unaware of some of their own beliefs being false, attribute Republican gains among Hispanics to disinformation. That's right. Uh, CNN viewers are less likely to believe it than the others, but still 54%. 63% of liberals, 60% of white Democrats, 61% of Biden voters, 59% of Democrats overall, Believe this. Believe it's disinformation, which is remarkable. Now, interestingly enough, uh, 23% of CNN viewers believe the reason Hispanics are moving to the GOP is because Republicans offer a better economic outlook than Democrats. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, and 32% of CNN viewers because Hispanics are socially conservative. Ding, 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 ding. This is remarkable, though, that so many Democrats believe these things, and yet the entire media conversation out there tends to be about misinformation and disinformation on the right because there is a bias in the press about these things. Now, if you listen to me regularly, you know I believe people are stupid, and it really doesn't matter what party and what belief. People tend to be stupid. Generally, in a, in a herd, they get even dumber. We live in a fallen world. People are stupid. But it's really striking to me how much of an obsession there is about disinformation and misinformation on the right, uh, disinformation and misinformation supposedly spread by the right and on Fox News, and no one in the media ever wants to get the left to account for their own disinformation and misinformation. And the reason why we can tell is because they themselves believe these things to be true. There is a deep loss of humility in the country, in particular in the media. When I get things wrong, whether it was the other day on, on the impact of Dobbs or in 2016 on not thinking Trump could win, a normal person should be able to sit down and say, okay, I got this wrong. Why did I get it wrong? And no one in the media seems capable of doing that. No one in the media seems capable of figuring out why the wascally wabbit continues to win. Why is it that the world works out differently from the way their worldview says it should work out? Why is this the case? And a lot of it has to do with tribal echo chambers, but the media itself is so much in that democratic tribal echo chamber that it doesn't realize that maybe the world isn't as they believe because they don't have anyone piercing their bubble of disinformation to share with them the way the world actually works. Rarely do those moments come along. And I think this gets also in, into where this election is headed because I do think it is true objectively Republicans are going to have a harder time with a massive wave. But I still think Republicans win. Maybe not the Senate, although I think they do by one. But they're definitely going to win the House. And yet you have Democrats now more and more convincing themselves that it's not even inevitable on the House side that this happens despite redistricting and headwinds and everything else because that bubble thinking becomes so dangerous. And it's one reason, dear listeners of mine, and readers of all of the stuff that I write. I try very hard to make a good faith effort to tell you what is actually going on in the world and not what you think is going on in the world because just like with the left, sometimes those things aren't true. And I don't always get it right, which is why I try to correct the record when I get it wrong. I'm not perfect either. But I try to do my best 
to give you an accurate lay of the land so there are no surprises as best we can help it when so many people on the left and the right these days just want to tell you what you want to hear. And when you're always told what you want to hear, you tend to begin to believe the mythologies that are not real and cannot believe anyone who comes to tell you they're wrong. And you think the person who's telling you the truth is lying to you because the liars profit from deluding you. Just like MSNBC's viewers are helping MSNBC make a profit, all while being comfortably lied to, told that their worldview is right and affirmed in everything they believe. And they'll be deluded when they get to election day. And Republicans do pretty good at the ballot box. One of the things that I like to tell you, in fact, I was with my, uh, had my first dinner last night for Children's Health Care of Atlanta, here in Atlanta, auctioned off a night to take someone to dinner. Uh, Mr. Lee and his daughter came to dinner with me at my favorite restaurant, Table in Maine. And he is now an owner of an Eden Pure Thunderstorm. And he said, I could tell you guys that I was right. The litter box smell for their cat, The Eden Pure eliminates it. It really does do a good job with pet smells, uh, smoke smells, fry odors in the kitchen, food odors and stuff. It wipes out odors. I don't actually use mine uh, for the dust and the pollen and stuff like that. I've got good air filtration systems in my air conditioner, but I don't have an exhaust fit in my kitchen. And when I go to a Helto room or a rental car and I need to wipe out an odor, the Eden Pure takes care of it. I can plug it in with a USB cord or I can keep just plug it into the wall. It works. Keep one in my suitcase. The Eden Pure Thunderstorm Air Purifier, you can get three of them for less than $200 by going to EdenPureDeals.com. EdenPureDeals.com. Put in the discount code ERIC3, E-R-I-C-K-3 on the front of the website. You'll get three of them. You'll get free shipping. You'll save $200 and get them for less than $200. EdenPureDeals.com. The discount code is ERIC3. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. I've only got about a minute here, so my apologies to those of you on hold. I really, I don't want to try to get to you and then have to immediately cut you off. So bear with me as we move on. Uh, I did mention earlier the Obama White House portrait. Have you seen it? Uh, it is a, the painting of Barack Obama. So they got a perfectly white background. As a partisan on the right, I guess I'm supposed to say I hate it. I actually don't. I don't really like photorealistic paintings. I never have. Just as a kid growing up, I never liked the hyper-realistic paintings, but I don't dislike this painting. I'm not as much a fan of Michelle Obama's, but on his, what I find amazing is that uh, that white background, one, it captures your eye. It forces you to look at the painting. But what I find so intriguing is... To some degree, it kind of affirms the thing I've always said about Barack Obama is that he was an empty vessel. He was really a great unknown. He said a lot of uh, soaring oratory things, but he left the left disappointed because they presumed he was one of their own. And as much as he was a progressive, was not as far to the left as they wanted him to go. But what happened is that people poured their hopes and dreams into him, and he became the thing that uh, anyone wanted. They could wish cast upon him, and it was so, whether it was actually true or not. So this white background for Obama's painting is, is to some degree, I don't think they intended it to be this way. And yet it's that background where you, just like so many people on the left did with Barack Obama himself, they can imagine the background as they wish it to be. And that was ultimately, I think, the flaw in Obama's presidency, regardless of all the the political philosophical disagreements. It's that the man was the empty vessel into which people pour their hopes and dreams, which left everyone somewhat disappointed in the end, even though they can't bring themselves to acknowledge it because of the historicity of his presidency, which is one reason the left has pushed Biden to go so far further to the left. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.